The monkey slid in the depths of the boat in a smelly little chamber between the zebras and the Hungarian with the trained bees. An Indian man, his name was Bika, Bika Baha, lived in with the monkeys in a hammock. Charlie could go in with the monkeys too, or he could sling a hammock in the feed hole, even further down the depth of the ship where the smell wasn't quite so monkeyish, but the air never changed, so it was still and thick and hard to breathe. Can't I sleep on deck? he asked Beha Baha. Beha Baha stretched his eyes. Very cold, he says, slightly shocked. A sailor guy's tread on you, it might be unpleasant. Charlie's duties were not too bad. He was to bring the monkeys food, watch Beha Baha as he fed them, clean their quarters and mend their clothes. Carrying the buckets of water was the worst part. Once you got used to the monkey poo smell, several other monkeys were called Dandy Jack. Why? asked Charlie. Because they ride the ponies, said Beha Baha, as if they had explained it. Where did we get dinner? Charlie asked. I do not eat, said Bika Baha. So Charlie asked, we're in front, so we're headed instead. It matters not, so long as the journey is undertaken with a pure heart, said Bika Baha. Charlie thought all the less than helpful and set up to find somebody with a more practical outlook and an opinion on where the dining room might be. There were at least three decks that Charlie could make out. In the deep hole was the feed, and God know what else. It was dark down there and smelly and dank, and Charlie found it quite Possible not to think of the deep cover of the water just the other side of the thick clinkered struts and beams of the hull. The second deck, just on the waterline, was where most of the animals lived. The cabins were small and it seemed almost as if there was something huge in the middle of the ship and everything else had to be stuffed and willy nilly around it to fit in as best it could. But it was a bit warmer and through the thick portholes you could see greenish daylight and sky usually. Tonight, in the reasonably flat waters of the river, the waterline crossed right along the middle of the portholes in the monkey cabin, so you could see sky in the top, semicircle, and dark water in the bottom half. The effect was peculiar and made Charlie feel a bit ill. The upper deck, where the humans lived, basked in full air and light. Pirouette had said she had a cabin here on the port side, near to Major Thurbit, which she shared with someone she called Madame Babu. Charlie thought that was the name. He was having a bit of trouble with the names and was pretty sure he would be calling it Tibbs Show, not Tipper Bodies Floating, Filler, Harmonic, what have you. Charlie decided to go and see her. She would know about dinner. She had the air of a girl who knew things. So how to find her cabin? He asked a sailor, got lost, asked another sailor, got lost, and asked another sailor who directed him to the door in front of his nose. His knock was asked by what could only be described as a beautiful lady with a large, fine, curly, silky black beard. He gulped. Hello, she said. She sounded French, like pirouette. Bonjour, madame, said Charlie politely, but still googling, goggling. How could a lady have a beard like that? Was it real? If it were fake, why would she be wearing it off juicy? And given what a fine beard it was, he could even smell it, a faint, clean tinge of lavender. Are you looking for pirouette, she asked. Yes, madame, said Charlie. He couldn't stop staring. There was no strings that he could see, nor signs of glue. Then, quick as a bird, the lady took Charlie's hand in hers and put it on her cheek. You can stroke, she said, her smile curling up into the corner of her elegant moustache. You like? Charlie couldn't tear his hand away. Her beard was beautifully soft and silky, like a very young goat's ears, or the curls between a calf's horns. We're about to go to eat, said the bearded lady. You like to come with us? Charlie just nodded. Bearded lady okay? He could handle that. Dinner took place in a long narrow chamber along the stern of the upper deck. Everybody took their dish up to the hatch and was given a dog of food. Tonight was stewed with dumplings in and green peas and a piece of bread. Then they sat about eating and gossiping and Charlie was able to see for the first time exactly who he was heading out to sea with. There was a group of about ten tiny Italians of all ages, with long noses and cheerful expressions, whom Charlie guessed were acrobats of some kind. There was a plump woman with a squint, wearing overalls. Snakes, said Madame Babu mysteriously. A rather tough-looking, short-headed man sat reading all through the meal. Mr Andrew, said Perret with a sniff, he leads the bears. An enormous young man came in rather late with an enormous dish and had three helpings. Hercules, strong man, said Madame Babu. And then a gang of energetic boys of about 20 chatting loudly, playing around and talking about horses with Francis the cowboy. The trick rider, said Pirouette. 
There were various children about the place too. Charlie was pleased to see. A downtrodden looking boy with mud on his face, a curly haired boy who sat with two squabbling pounds ignoring them, and two girls of about nine who had to be twins, wearing matchy sh matching shifts and imitating each other's every move. They were interesting to watch, but they made Charlie feel seasick. What do you do? Charlie asked Pirouette. I am a trapezium, she said with a proud little smile. Gosh, said Charlie, because he felt he ought. He could tell by Pirouette's tone of voice that a trapezium was clearly fan fantastically cool, but he hadn't a clue what it meant. Gosh, she said politely. The bed lady shot a look at him a look and went to him. You will see, she said, when we do the show. When will that be? he asked eagerly. We go to Paris now, said Pirouette. We have a date for the big show in just one week. The Imperial Ambassador is having a big party. He invites all the Eastern wanted it. We are we are to be to be the fun for them. They will all come. Paris, he tried to remember where Paris was. Sort of in the middle, but north. Certainly nowhere near the sea. So when they got to land he could find a cat and get more information and move on. Charlie, to tell the truth, was having contra contradictory feelings. With the circus, he realised he felt safe. All the activity and so many people would give him some pr protection if Ruffy was coming after him. So on the one hand, he was looking forward to snooping all over the ship, finding the animals and making friends, and above all, seeing the show, the real magic of the circus. He hoped and hoped that this wasn't disloyal to his parents, that there'd be chances to see and do loads of things before they got to France. On the other hand, running through this cheerful prospect like an icy cup was a constant repeating knowledge of his parents' danger. And just behind it was the figure of Raffi, cool, unknown, frightening, challenging. But until they reached France, there was nothing much he could do. Okay, it's frustrating, but he could handle it. Pera was still talking. We can only make the show in the big top. We take us to where the people are, then we come on board and we make the show. They come on board, said Charlie, who had been listening to his fears, not to Pirouette. He wasn't sure if he was understanding right. You haven't seen the big top, said Mardine Babu. She wondered at this boy, so alone, so distracted, yet so accepting. Oh, Charlie, we have the most beautiful sized circus ring here on the boat, with the seats and the sawdust and the flying trapeze and the stripy tent roof and everything. Now Charlie was very much now Charlie very much wanted to hear more about how he could fit a circus ring onto a boat and where it was and when and when he would get to see it. But just at that moment another person entered the cabin. He was not tall like Major Morris, nor was he huge like Kirkley, nor amazing like the bearded lady. He was a brown haired, brown skinned man of about forty, or maybe fifty, an African, well built, quiet and very calm. What was strange was that he seemed to bring a wake of calm with him. It was as if nothing that was not calm could get anywhere near him, and if it tried to, it became calm, no matter what his intention had been in the first place. Silence spread out from him, stillness formed a pour around him. Even as he walked in the trip rider stopped laughing, and the Italians turned their faces quietly to their plates. Pirouette and Madame Babu stopped chatting. A forced gentleness descended on the company. Charlie could not take the eyes off this man, and he could not understand why. Then the man turned to face Charlie and looked straight at him. His eyes were deep well of darkness, and then suddenly from deep within these dark eyes, Charlie saw a flash, a reflection of light, light, light from an animal's eyes, as the man turned his head away again. Who is he? Charlie whispered to Madame Babu, huddling a little closer to her. Ah, he is our dear, Makamo, she said. Charlie was surprised. Was she being sarcastic? Dear was not the kind of word he would apply to that man. He is our lion tamer. Oh, he doesn't like us to say tamer. He is our lion trainer. He is African just like you. He may be African, thought Charlie, but he is not like me. He is like, he is like the feeling you get when your father is angry with you. He is scary and this calm he carries with him is not a good relaxed calm. It is a calm of fear. Charlie shivered. Lion tamer, huh? Well, he certainly seemed to have this lot tamed. He glanced at Pirouette. She was looking at her meal and seemed not to want to look up. Makamu had put Charlie right off his food, so he just sat and listened to the gentle conversation that flowed about the cabin as, as the circus pushed, finished, as circus people finished their dinners. One of the talents was trying to persuade one of the others to get his mandolin and give a song. Mr. Eric Andrews, the bear leader, had offered part of his newspaper to the Hungarian. Some new people came in, a large, proud-looking bald man. What does he do? inquired Charlie eagerly, but Madame Babu just gave him a look as if to say he should know better than to ask.
There is a small group of wiry Arab boys and a very tall, elegant, pale man with feathery white hair and exceptionally long hands and feet. Charlie found himself giving Madun a pleading look and she relented enough to say, Al Diabo, which didn't help Charlie much. He needed a dictionary. Looking round the dining room, Charlie thought they looked like a rather large and odd family. He smiled to himself. He liked it here, at least. He would have, if only. After dinner, the twins came over and said, both of them, Hello, we're the twins. Who are you? I'm Charlie, said Charlie. I'm helping with the monkeys. The twins looked at each other meanfully. They con then continued, Major Tip always puts people with the monkeys first. He'll have you doing something else soon. Do you have any chocolate? It was amazing the way they talked together. How could they have known to jump from talking about Major Tibau, actually Major Tib was much easier, to talking about chocolate? If this was a trick for the show, it's a very good one. I do, actually. Would you like some? Yes, they said and smiled. They were weird. Charlie said goodnight to Pirouette, who had done her tight hair down, suddenly looked much nicer. And Madame Babu, who made a promise to come to breakfast with him the next day and went off with the twins. Part of him wanted Pirouette to want him to stay with her rather than go with the other girls, but she said nothing, so he went. Also, he wanted to find out if the twins would talk in tandem all the time or if they would start to talk separately. Charlie didn't quite know his way back to the monkey cabin where he had left his things, but the twins, with Sarah and Tara, they said, were able to show him where it was. Well, they could show him where the cabin was, but where the chocolate was was another thing. And no secret, the monkey had been in Charlie's bag and they'd scoffed the chocolate, the remaining biscuits and the sugar lups and the tea bags. Yuck, said the twins. Raw tea bag? Maybe they're one person and two bodies, Charlie thought. That would make sense. Oh no, it wouldn't, he thought then. How could one person and two bodies make sense? Sarah and Tara then announced that they had some chocolate in their cabin. He followed them back up to the open deck, along towards the bows, bows, right into the bows, as it seemed, and then suddenly the girls turned and disappeared from view. Oi, called Charlie, where are you? Where are you gone? We're here, the girls called, and their heads popped out as if it were from a hole in the wall by the figurehead. This is where we stay. Their cabin was right inside the figurehead's chest. It was sort of triangular, and though they had no porthole as such, if you climbed a ladder in the top corner of the curiously shaped chamber, you found yourself inside the figurehead's face, and you could look out the spy holes cut into her beautiful green eyes, and you could peer through a thick glass window behind the great smiling teeth of her a smile. Now, of course, there was nothing to see but a few swaying stars, misty and far away, but in the daytime, what a view that would be! When Charlie had mined the ship from the outside earlier that day, he had had no idea that the figurehead was hollow, with a peculiar little room inside where the two girls lived. This is absolutely amazing, he said. This is amazing. I am amazed. The girls, acting together as always, found the chocolate. Then they unrolled their bunk, and there was just room for all three to sit on it. There was no floor, place, floor space left, and stuck to nibble the way into happy chocolate. A knock at the door made them jump. Password, cried the twins. Fuck it, said a voice, and the door opened, and in much the curly boy had been with the clowns. Ah, you've got him, he cried in a cheerful tone. The twins have got him. He called over his shoulder and found behind for him, and, and from behind him, Charlie could hear a chattering, scrubbling sound, which turned out to be muddy-faced boy and four or five of the smallest Italians who'd come to investigate Charlie. They all tried to come into the twins' cabin. The Kim told them there wasn't room. And then a great gooing noise started up from behind one of the walls and the twins said, Now look, you've woken the dark doves and shooed everybody, including Charlie, out. Where are you sleeping, said the coily boy to Charlie. Don't know, said Charlie. I was meant to be in with the monkeys, but since they've been through my bag and eaten everything, I don't fancy it much. Do you want to come and kick with us in the rope store, asked the coily boy. It's above the galley, so we never get cold. It keeps the ropes dry too, so they don't rot. It's next to the lions. The boy was going on about the lions needing the heat too, but Charlie wasn't listening. Next to the lions? There were lions? He had been told, and he knew it, but only now did he really get through to him. There were lions on the ship, and he was going to be next door to them. End of chapter 7